This episode may contain stories of domestic violence. Please be advised. Welcome to the Sage Advice Podcast, where each week we sit down with people just like you who have left abusive relationships and found healing. Don't forget to check out our website, sage.community, because together we can survive abuse with grace and empathy. Now sit back and get comfortable. The Sage Advice Podcast starts right now. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Sage Advice Podcast. Today's guest is Tina. She reached out to me on Facebook and wanted to share her journey with everyone. Amidst the chaos of her abusive relationship, Tina found guidance from some unexpected places, and eventually she decided to pursue massage therapy as a way to help other trauma victims cope and to help them heal their bodies through positive touch. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Here is my conversation with Tina. So let's welcome Tina to the show. Hey, Tina, thanks for being here. Hi, nice to meet you and thank you for having me. Of course, of course. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and what motivated you to reach out about this topic? Um, Well, I'm a licensed massage therapist in Connecticut. And when I decided to do this venture, I wanted to focus on trauma because it's been a constant thing throughout my life, starting from childhood. So I... I have a very big identifying and empathetic view with it because of how long I have dealt with it to the point where I had been diagnosed with complex PTSD because of it. Um, And the last portion of it was dealing with my previous marriage, um, which I'm, of course, not going to badmouth an individual, but um, it was definitely traumatic and abusive with an addiction situation. Um, and it rendered me to a point of suicidal, uh, because it got, it got, it gets you to a point where you feel like you cannot escape and you, and you don't know what to do and no one's there to help you and no one's going to understand. So your final thought is, well, I'll just end it all and it'll all go away. Um, and that's how far low was my lowest point. And that was around probably like 2015, um, between 2014 and 15. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, it's been a, personally, it's been something that's happened in my universe this, this week. And, and I, I think just sharing that with everybody can help save somebody. Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, addiction is a, a very hard, um, thing to, to get through just on the addict side, um, which is why I'm not going to ever bad mouth an addict um, yeah. because it's, it's, a, it's a disease. Um, however, though, when you get sucked into the rabbit hole um, that they bring you in um, and you do every, when you're a nurturing person and a caretaking person, um, you try to do everything possible. And when you take your vows very seriously, you're like in sickness and in health that I need to take care of this person. Of course. And you go above and beyond means to the point where you lose who you are. And then you lose the ability to function. You lose the ability to just get up every day and go to work without wondering where is this person? Uh, are they using, are, did they leave the house? Did they steal? Did they get in trouble? Are they arrested again? Are they in jail again? It's like this constant, constant repeat. It's like, it's like this roller coaster ride that just doesn't stop. Um, and I went through that for about 10 years and I just decided to jump off the roller coaster. Um, so, and that was in New York. And when I jumped off my roller coaster, I will definitely label it as running away. I ran away. I picked up my dogs, my mattress, um, my clothes, TV, um, whatever I could pack in one hour. And I left the state and I went to a whole other state and just... 
was the suicide your turning point or was it something else that happened? Well, what was pretty interesting about that is um, my ex, when he was using, unfortunately, was quite violent and uh, verbally abusive. So um, there was always a tornado chaos in our home. And you get used to the was, chaos. Oh, yeah, you do. It gets comfortable, actually, because you're so used to it. Yeah. Um, but the suicidal thoughts started to occur when I just felt like I was not going to ever escape. And when he would threaten that he was going to kill me or he was going to find my family and kill them all or whatever he would threaten when he was using. Um, I had a, this is going to sound a little weird, but I had a dream um, and a figure of what would be identified as Mary came to me in my dream. And she told me to bead a rosary and made me laugh because I'm from New York and I woke up from my dream and I cursed and I'm like, what the F? I don't know how to beat a rosary. <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know how to read the Bible. So I, I just was like taken aback by the dream. And then she kept coming to me in the same dream, the same place, the same, it was a hill with a tree, a uh, beautiful blue sky. And I would sit at the tree and she would, this figure I can't say an individual person because I didn't see her features, but this figure kept coming and it, it felt like a mother, which is why I identified it as Mary. And I finally agreed to start beating a rosary and I beaded my nephew's communion rosary. And I did it in the middle of my living room while my ex was having a meltdown. And it was the first time I discovered peace and chaos. I felt like when a tornado goes through a town and it leaves only the one house standing, I was that one house. And then I started beating for over a year oh, wow. every day. She would come every day in my dream and every day I'd make a new beating and every day I'd make this. And then all of a sudden I started posting pictures of it on Facebook. And it was funny because I would post them up there, my designs. And then people go, Oh my God, I want that. How much is that? Or, oh my God. I, I love that. How much is that? And then I was like, I don't know. I, I I don't know, whatever you got. She's just telling me to make them, people. I don't know what to do with it. And then I started selling them. And then I started working on people that had funerals. And they took their dried flowers and they would send it to me. And I would continue to dry their flowers further. And I would actually make beads out of those flowers. And then I would construct a rosary and mail it back to them as a memorial. That's beautiful. I did that for a while. And this whole time, in those like two and a half years, he was still in his own cavernous world of insanity and getting arrested in the middle as well, leaving me alone. I had to fend from things with money. But during that whole time, I never once went back to chaos. And then I... Your analogy or or your metaphor of like standing in the town as a tornado goes by and just, you're just in a quiet, sleepy little town. That's a, it's a great way to describe it. And I'm, I'm happy for you that you mentally were able to find that. It just took a while. It took a while. And then to physically leave was very difficult because he was still in the house and I had to pack while he was there and he knew I was leaving. He didn't know where I was going. He didn't know when I was going but he knew something was changing and every day it was an argument and his narcissism got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. They he would trash me. Oh yeah. Changing. He would trash me on Facebook and all kinds of stuff. And the whole entire time I just continued to maintain the peace and the chaos. And I learned it's like if you've ever been in the, in the ocean and there's a storm in, in, in the area and everything's, tormented and like there's waves and sounds and thunder and lightning to get away from all of it if you just dive it's quiet it's calm and i had to learn how to dive in me and everything else just disappeared and it took a while for me to get there it took a very very long time it was it was just very difficult and then when i moved the funny thing was, is most people would think you left the turmoil. It's like, ah, oh, freedom. You sing hallelujah. No. <laughs> no. I was in a house, a beautiful three-bedroom home. I had a wonderful neighborhood, beautiful neighbors. And the quiet made me my anxiety like spike every yeah. day because I was waiting for the chaos. And I was so uncomfortable. You knew in the, the chaos. Quiet. 
we're oh, yeah. comfortable in the chaos now. Right. Mm-hmm. So learning how to adapt to what people would la- label quote unquote normalcy um, was so foreign to me that I would cry in the beginning because I'm like, what, what, what am I supposed to do? I don't know right. what to do with this. Um, and it was very, very difficult to adapt. And then because of the fact that I have post-traumatic stress disorder on top of obsessive compulsive disorder, on top of, I don't know, abandonment anxiety. issues, we can go on and on. We've and already general gone there. Anxiety. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have labels that could last probably a lifetime. Um, once I, my PTSD started kicking in more, uh, that fight or flight and that, that unsettling feeling that I always have with PTSD waiting for the next shoe to drop. Um, I decided to find a massage school. Why I don't, I woke up one day and said, you know what? I'm going to go look for a massage school. I went and found one. I fell in love with the school and the environment and impulsive, which is very common in PTSD. Um, my impulsivity led to, you know what? I'm going to spend $15,000 and become a massage therapist. And I'm going to go to school at night, three days a week, from six to nine <laughs> while I work in New York from six in the morning until two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Sometimes somehow you just have a calling. This. You do yeah, this, doing this podcast, doing Sage, it was what I had to do. Um, I had the same when I got my dog, I could not go from chaos, moving around, living on people's couches to complete quiet. It wasn't going to happen. So I got a dog who barks at everything, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, yeah, you tr- it, you it tried to fill that void. I did. Well, I I didn't know he was going to bark at, any, at everything, but he and and he's been the, the best companion. But I understand that whole like you've been in chaos now for for a long, long time. That's what you're used to, and so the quiet is scary. Correct, and that's like a major difference between uh, post traumatic stress disorder and complex post traumatic stress. Um, one regular PTSD. Um, if you think about like, um, I don't know, a military veteran, they come home. Um, that one traumatic event that they experienced gets, once they start getting into therapy and sometimes they need medication, whatever it may be, um, that event then becomes kind of filed and they can move a little more forward in their life. With complex PTSD, it's constant chronic trauma from years past to current. It just keeps going. Like before my husband, it was my ex-husband, it was uh, 9-11 because I was mm-hmm. six blocks away during 9-11. So my PTSD Ooh. immediately got charged again. Of course. Um, so, you know, it, it was just been a constant, as soon as I get through one stage of it, something else happens and now I'm dealing with it again. Um, and it rears its ugly head. And unfortunately, because of the years of it, um, granted, I've had been in therapy since I was a child. Um, all the way up on and off now, and I'm almost 47. Um, excuse me, I am 47, I'm going to be 48. But um, I've been in therapy my whole life on and off. So I've learned many, many tools. And unfortunately, with uh, PTSD and the what version I have, um, I have what's called creepies. So like out of nowhere, a creep will go up my spine Mm. And it'll start my anxiety. It'll start my panic. It'll start my overthinking. It'll start my, uh, am I, you know, I'll freeze for a minute and try to figure out what my next move is going to be. It'll start my plan A, B, C, D, E, and F, you know, to get out of the situation. Yeah. Um, you know, my mouth starts turning, my hamster starts turning. Um, my current boyfriend now, he, we joke because he calls me hammy from over the hedge because I spin like a squirrel when I get in that mode. And it's very yeah. difficult for me to stop and slow down. Um, you never really know tools. when it's going to happen either. That's why I call it creepy. It just creeps mm-hmm. out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. It's a creep up the spine. Um, but I've learned to identify it. That's one of the things that I work on now is I learn to identify and label. I call it a name. It exists. And once I know it exists, I could sit there and process it and try to flow with it and adjust with it mm-hmm. and rationalize it so it doesn't become this irrational thought yeah talk yourself through it and correct like no it's almost like you're talking to yourself like you were a parent or a teacher but to me for me it's like you know what we've been through this before Mm -hmm. it's gonna pass you're gonna be fine just focus on right now exactly exactly and a lot of changes that have happened in my life in the last four and a half five years have been dramatic 
and very, very dramatic in a positive way. I, I would not think where I am right now, I would have been five years ago at all. I'm in a completely different zone in space, which is amazing. Is it more peaceful? 110,000% it is. And I learned to find, no, I learned to grow. I don't want to say find myself. Matter of fact, I try to tell people not to say that because you're never the same person that you ever were. You've learned to grow. You've learned to evolve. You've learned to change. And you've learned to accept the changes that you now have. So I will definitely say that I didn't find me again. I kind of regret me. Yeah, I love that. I love that you brought that up. That's something that I tried to explain to my friends, you know, right after everything happened because I wasn't the same. I wasn't the same as I was in the relationship. I was not definitely not the same as I was prior to the relationship. And that was going to take a lot of time. Hey guys, it's Erin. In this episode, Tina received spiritual guidance to help her on her journey. If you want to strengthen your own spiritual connection, please join our group classes on spirituality. You can register at sage.community or on Facebook at sign our sage community. Now back to the show. And I mean, when you go through things like someone threatening to kill you Mm -hmm. or uh, he knows this chasing me around the house with a samurai. So I tell him he's going to cut my head off. Um, that becomes kind of crazy to live in every day. (laughs) You don't know what you're going to come home to or climbing through the window of your house because the person's catatonic from ketamine and they're not answering the door and you got to like climb through to get into the home and call the police department and the ambulance and you're sitting there worried, are they going to die today? Because, oh my God, they look catatonic. And then they come back and it's like... uh, I don't, I don't know how the person kept doing it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful. Back and then it's better for, you know, a few hours a day where they make you believe that it could always be peaceful and happy. Oh, yes. The promises. I love the, the promises. promises. Uh, you know, yes. it's that up and down. It's that roller coaster that you're just constantly on. It could be a few days here, a few days there. Could be within the same hour. I think that's you know, what people pretty... don't understand. You know, it was pretty intense is that, again, I'm a neuroscience study person. I love to study neuroscience. I take courses all the time because I'm fascinated with the brain. And what I found very fascinating and discovered, which is why I kept studying more, is because his drug of choice was crack cocaine. And crack cocaine has a very distinct smell. Very distinct. It's hard to describe. I, I usually say it smells like burning metal, but it's, it's a very distinct smell. And I smelled it a lot with him. And it got to a point in my life when I was away from him, I thought I one day smelt that smell. And because your olfactory nerve is a direct connection into your hippocampus in the brain, the deep brain where your memories are, that smell immediately went up into the memory sector and immediately put me into a mode of what is that? Where is it coming from? Who's doing that? Where is it? Oh my God, is somebody doing crack in the house? Where is it? Oh my God, if I, where am I smelling? And it just went into the spin of, an, of panic, all from a smell. Yeah. It's amazing how uh, smells work with the brain, um, which is why when I'm doing with my work in massage, I use a lot of aromatherapy, which I'll talk about if you want later, but I I use a lot of aromatherapy and not aromatherapy, but just essential oil, but it's a, it's a very large thing I do, but because I like to offer different types of smells, depending on a person's makeup and their intake. Um, cause like just for example, okay, if someone has depression, you're not going to really do a lot of lavenders, um, and, sleepy kind of feeling stuff or chamomiles because depression, it can make them more depressed. So what you do with depression is you want to put in your citrus smells, your lemon smells, your peppermint smells, those, those strong smells that get up into the olfactory and open you up and waken you. I love that. I didn't know that. Yes. That's what you want to do. I thought lavender was good for anything. Lavender is good for PTSD and lavender is good for anxiety because you want the higher amygdala people lowered. You want them to calm down. Depressed people are usually normally calm. They're so calm that they don't get up in the day. Um, They sleep all day. 
um, most of the time. They don't like to function. Yeah. So the so, waking up makes a lot of sense. Correct. So you have to base it on individual. So like with aromatherapy, what I do is I have between uh, aromatherapy special candles that I buy from a beautiful person in New York, or I have essential oil blends that I actually created myself. And I'll do a setup in the room for smell based on the individual person and what they're going to need. So if it's a person that needs uplifting, then we'll do uplifting things in sensory when it comes to the olfactory. If we're somebody that needs more calming or maybe they suffer insomnia and they need something to bring them down for calming, then I'll do uh, aromatherapy based on that. Um, So it's very, very customized and tailored um, when they come in this room. Everything is down. I use a lot of things. I use a lot of sensory work in here, aside from touch. So you touched on it earlier, but, you know, let's circle back to the effect on the body that this trauma has and how you deal with that as a massage therapist. Well, for myself, just to start, when I was in massage school, I went in there with the idea of, I'm going to massage people. This is great. I didn't realize that I had to get on a table and people were going to touch me. Now, as a person that was in an abusive marriage um, and has been in physical and has been physically abused in the past as a teenager um, with other men and boyfriends, um, to have someone touch me was uncomfortable. Um, I didn't know how to deal with that. So when I got on the table, my teacher at the time, the first month I was in school, we were in Swedish class, and my teacher, who was severely amazing, um, she understood what I told her what was going on, why I'm afraid. And once I got on the table, she was next to me most of the time while the person was, te- while she was teaching them how to massage me. And I would grip the table. I would grip the table. I would grip my fists. She knew I was extremely tense. And I cried a lot the first month, like a lot, the whole time I was on the table. Body's to just have, holding on to it. It just, it, it was foreign. And not even so much holding on, it was foreign. I didn't know what it was. And I didn't understand the difference between something feeling great and something like, is something bad going to happen soon? Because it always does. Mm. That's like that mental thing you put in your head. Um, so after that class and after all the crying I did, Um, I finally learned that this is cool. This feels good. It is cool. And the more I was in my job in school for 17 months, the more I was in school because of COVID, um, I, every day, the trust level that grew from my peers, my classmates, my teachers, the school, Every day my trust grew and every day the feeling of getting a massage, feeling like you were in a cocoon of something comfortable, just grew exponentially. By the time I graduated, I was profoundly dedicated to proving that massage, although most people look at it as a luxury, is beyond that. It is a very, very therapeutic tool to teach people like me, domestic abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, PTSD, general anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, agoraphobia, that it's very beneficial for them to learn and understand that having that kind of touch even if it's just a laying of a hand, having that kind of touch and learning how to build that trust is probably far more worth than just getting your muscle rubbed out. Because once you get your mind completely on board with this new normal and it starts to rewire and it starts to reprocess, your body will naturally fold down. Like if you have ever seen somebody come in a room and they're very tense up. I see it a few times with a couple of my clients. They come in, they're tensed up, their shoulders are raised, their fists are grisped, you know, they're very uncomfortable, they're yeah, rambling. Sure. 
they're rambling about their day. And then when they walk in the room, and if you just lay them down, and most times I have my aromatherapy already started, I have everything set up, I have light set up in a certain way in this room. As soon as they come in, you can immediately see the shoulders just drop. I don't even have to touch them yet. It was just the environment that just completely made their tense shoulders go down. It's your, you know, your body before your brain can just sense the, the peace and the healing. And the safety. That's yeah. another thing. They feel safe. If someone feels uncomfortable in the room, trust me, they're not going to want to be in the room. They're going to be like, oh, I don't like this place. And their instinct is going to tell them to leave. But I set this up in a way that when they first walk in here, everything falls to the floor. Yeah. And then after that, once they're on the table, I massage differently than most. I, I for myself, don't prefer to use uh, a lot of deep tissue work or trigger point work because when you're tra- traumatized already, traumatizing the body more can make it worse. And then people can disassociate on the table. And then people can have episodes of, of things, you know, and it, it, it's not therapeutic. So what I do is very slow, very slow moving um, and broad stroked. But I do put pressure. Um, but yeah, so when I was in school, school actually taught me how to massage and body work and nurturing and how the element of touch, which starts from the womb, how it actually can help people on this level. It, it's, it's pretty insane. And there's not one one client I've ever spoken to yet that has said that they don't feel good now. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. I mean, I I encourage everyone to to find a massage therapist like you, and and not to say anything against the the chains or anything, but oh no no, you wanna you want somebody who really cares about your whole being. And, there, and there's a place for every type educated. of massage therapist. There's a yeah. place for everybody. You got your sports people, you got your chiropractic type, you got your orthopedic type, you got your, you know, uh, just maybe just want to do more energy work, which I understand energy work because I do energy work as well. Um, everybody has their type and style, which is why when people come to me and I feel I'm not a good fit, I'll, I will refer them out. I have a network of people. I'll say, you know what? I think this person's better for you. And I'll refer them out because I want people to be where they need to be. Yeah. But with, with trauma people, it's not simple massage. Matter of fact, you may, they may sign up for a 90 minute massage. You might have someone that comes in that has a domestic abuse situation and they want to relax and they come in for a 90. Nine times out of 10, you're lucky they're going to stay for a 30 Mm. because it's too intense. Too emotional. It's too much. And what I do is I'm, I govern my time on them. So if my client can only do 30 minutes and they don't even want to be touched, they want to just lay there snuggled up in a blanket, that's fine. Hopefully next time when they come back, we'll do this again and try a little more. But it's trust. Trust is a very big thing in trauma. You have to build trust with people. If, if you don't do that, it's all for, it's all for mood. It, it just doesn't work. I mean, for myself, if I don't trust somebody with all my my own mental stuff, I, I'm going to immediately close myself down, shut off, and that's it. And that's how most people work when they suffer trauma. Yeah, I I think it's important to remind people too don't don't push yourself because you think that's where you should be. You should be able to get a massage if you're not there yet. You're not there yet. I mean, I went to a spiritual meditation class and my brain couldn't let me go mm-hmm. to, you know, just walk down a path in my, in my subconscious mind or whatever the suggestion was in the class, because I wasn't there yet. I needed to be in control of my surroundings for safety. Mm-hmm. Self-preservation. And, right. And that was just a meditation class. Well, he wasn't going to jump in the door and find me and attack me while I was sitting there with my eyes closed. But it's that, you know, you need to listen to yourself. Exactly. Because it's, it's normal to be concerned about your safety. Well, I've told many clients, it's okay to not be okay. That's the first thing you got to remember. There's no normal. There's no real true normal. 
And the other thing that I want, I always want my clients to remember, and I try to help them with, is I try to give them tools a lot. So I try to give them breathing techniques, things like that, to learn how to calm the brain. It's hard to control something. Control is actually almost basically an illusion. We never can control anything for the most part. But what we can do is just take a tool and try to find some sort of a center. And sometimes meditation was hard for me too, because I couldn't shut my brain off until I learned that I didn't have to shut my brain off. I I learned that I can meditate even if my brain is still going. Mm Because as long as I'm still and as long as I'm comfortable and as long as I'm relaxed and my body's relaxed, my mind can spin. It's what it's normal to do. It's natural. But as long as I'm still and in a still moment, then my body will eventually slow down. And so will anybody else's. I really loved the spiritual meditation and that's why I'm doing some free classes on it because I had those dreams like you did that were telling me something and obviously it was coming from somewhere. And so with the spiritual meditation, it just allows you to explore that a little bit more about what, where you're going and what what you're supposed to be doing. So totally understand that. Well, we're getting close to the end of the time and thank you so much. I've loved our conversation. You're so open and honest about everything. So any, any parting words of advice, words of wisdom for people listening? Um, I would definitely want people to know that no matter what, there's always a way out and there's always a way up. You just have to sit down and find a space of quiet. I loved it. And, and just believe, just believe that it's there because it is there. We're just a little blinded usually. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I want, I want people to remember that there's always a way up and there's always a way out. No, I don't know. get desperate. There is. And, you know, if you guys need help getting out, if somebody listening needs help getting out, we've got resources on the website, sage.community, the local, your local boots on the ground victims advocacy group is, is the best way to go. So know that we're here for you. And Tina, thank you so much for coming on and sharing everything, you know, and thank you for the work that you're doing every day to help people heal. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. I look forward to growing further and further in my life with it. Great, great. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for listening to this week's episode. Check out those meditation classes. Um, You can link them up on the website or the Facebook page, and we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. Well, that's our show. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or if you're willing to share your story, please email us at sageadvicepodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, remember, when you're kind to yourself, the healing can begin. See you next time. This show was brought to you by inflowradio.com, the best curated talk radio network for personal development, wellness, spirituality, and conscious business. If you or someone you love is in immediate danger, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. For more information, please see the resources tab at sage.community.